Hi again guys and welcome to what you no doubt noticed was a huge video and if you didn't already notice take a look at the time marker down below because it really is a massive video. Now as always all of the topics and subjects in this video as with all of the Beards and Cars episodes are listed down in the description so if you haven't got the time to watch the whole thing you want to maybe chop and change jump around to different points or just watch it out of sequence then of course you can do that if you want to as with all of the episodes. And for those who maybe haven't watched this series before, which is probably a few people because we haven't covered it in a few weeks, Beards and Cars is a series which is much less formal in structure than many of the review or tuning series that I do, because this is basically where we talk about everything else in the world of the channel. It could be YouTube-related, movie-related, gaming, cars in general or completely different stuff, and often it's based on topics which you guys put down below. Kind of like a Q&A, in terms of its wider appeal as well. And because of the fact that I haven't done it in a couple of weeks, we have more Q&A points to cover, from the previous two episodes in particular. And so for this overall episode, it's kind of a two-purpose video. Because it's not just beards and cars, this is also... The long-awaited by very few people, but still by some, I have had some questions, about the final episode of Black Sight, which was a playthrough that I did a long time ago, last year it actually was, and I think I did four episodes, if I remember correctly, and this is the final one. So I decided to do this really long video primarily to cover the last episode of Black Sight, to finally actually release it because at least releasing it this way allows you to watch it if you wanted to see the ending of the game, but also just as a Beards and Cars episode in general, so it's a two-purpose video. So with that in mind, this is the first Beards and Cars video which actually follows the function of the time rather than the time of the video following the discussion, if you know what I mean. So basically, it's an hour and 20 minute video regardless. So I decided to compile a ton of subjects to talk about, to really cover loads of bases, because we've got that kind of time. And this is, incidentally, going to be the only video that I put out today, because it's a long video. If you've got more than one video and you want to check out this one, then the other one's just going to be a distraction. So that's going to be it for today. Plus, of course, it takes a while to edit this kind of thing and to record it. So we're just keeping it simple. So with that in mind, let's first of all cover some of the subjects and topics which you guys raised questions or concepts or theoretical scenarios, which is often the case, usually in the racing world, that's a lot of the stuff that we discuss in Beards and Cars, but also after that, I wanted to take the opportunity with this much longer form video to get into not necessarily subjects which are asked a lot, but subjects which come up in comments on my videos quite a bit, frequently asked questions, if you want to look at it that way, questions or statements or viewpoints that people will often have about this channel, or the way I run the channel, which this is a good forum to answer. Not necessarily once and for all, because you always get people who haven't seen it, who will then ask again later. So, of course, it's not the be-all and end-all, but for those who were wondering about the things that I'm going to discuss, some of which, as I said, you can see down below, then we can clear up some of those. So, first of all, as far as your subjects go, the first one that we can dive into is... An interesting concept and an interesting theoretical question, and that is within the world of racing, which, as I said, we do discuss quite a lot, specifically the Le Mans, but sometimes other ones as well, what would be my personal ideal set of racing regulations? For instance, for a racing series, Can-Am, LMP, F1, NASCAR, those kind of things. Well, for me personally... The main affinity that I have with race cars has always been prototype race cars. Not just the Le Mans, but pretty much all prototypes. GTP cars, the Daytona prototypes, Group C cars, more recently the LMP 900s, the LMP 1s, 2s and 3s, even the GT1 prototypes. I've always loved those kind of cars, and I think probably my own interpretation of racing rules would most likely center around that kind of racing. But the difference with my category of racing, or my racing series, or whatever you want to consider it as, would probably be that I would like to combine elements of modern-day LMP racing 
with 70s Can-Am. And that's probably not too surprising for those who have heard me talk about my favourite race cars before, because those two bases cover most of my fandom. Because I love prototypes, as I said, I love a lot of the things that they do, but also the thing that I don't like about them is basically the same thing that I don't like about most forms of modern racing. And that is that they've become kind of boring to me personally, because it's become more and more about the drivers and the teams, less so about specific cars. Cars don't make as much of an impression anymore when you think about the modern Le Mans. Most people wouldn't be able to name, for instance, half of the LMP cars on the grid, if not more. Even super fans of the Le Mans might be able to name them all. Whereas back in the day, if you showed someone the grid, you'd be able to name most of them. You've got your 787Bs, your Peugeot 905s, March cars, Allard cars, various other teams that aren't winners, but they're still well-known and well-respected and talked about and very technologically advanced, even if they didn't win. Whereas these days, you've got all of these smaller privateer companies from stuff like Alpine, Ginetta, a variety of others as well, that people might know of, but you don't really hear people saying, oh, I love Ginetta, or I love Alpine. There are doubtless people who do, but it's just not the same kind of fandom that people had in the 90s. You mentioned the Mazda 787B, you've got dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of people who adore that car, understandably so. If you mention the Peugeot 905, the Toyota GT1, the Nissan R390, my personal favourite of them all, the R92CP, all of these icons, not just because of their age, but because of how genuinely good they were, have significant fandoms. Even the ones which weren't successful, like the Minolta from Toyota, the 88CV, which never even raced in the Le Mans. It still has so many fans, thanks in part, a major part even, to the Gran Turismo franchise, with its inception in GT4 right up to GT6. So for me, it would definitely have elements of that, but in particular, not just prototypes in general, because I have much more of an interest in LMP1s than LMP2s or LMP3s, for obvious reasons, they're the best of them all, the fastest, but I actually like Group Cs the most, because, like the Can-Am, the rules allowed them to be much more technologically creative, especially once you got into the early 90s and the cars like the Peugeot 905 and some others started to almost become like a fusion of Group C and Formula One tech. For instance, the Peugeot had a much more F1-style construction and even an F1-spec engine than pretty much anything that had come before it. Whereas in the 80s, they were very much, as the name implied, sports prototypes. That's what they literally were. The Porsche 956s, the 962s, the Jaguar XJR series. They were full-on prototypes, but they felt more... Not necessarily like road cars, but they felt more like, say, supercars even. Racing equivalents of supercars. Whereas those early 90s cars... Even the 787B, but the 787B was almost like a remnant of the late 80s designs, they started to feel more and more like more significantly bodied F1 cars. So like a cockpit version of an F1 car. Like the Peugeot. The Peugeot 905 is super lightweight, about 750 kilos, which is so much lower than most LMPs before and after it. And it's because it has so much F1 tech. It's got that 3.5 litre V10, again, F1 spec engine. So... I would personally love to have a series which not just pays homage to that, but also very directly is inspired by it. In fact, even getting stuff which looks more like those old school cars. Because with the FIA and the regulations that they have, it's not impossible to have cars that are safer, but that simultaneously pay homage and take inspiration from those golden age hyper-fast race cars. You can do both. You can definitely do both. Because if you think about it, most of the safety features which are now in most forms of racing are not based around the aerodynamic design of the car. They're based around the stuff that you don't see, such as the thought behind the car, the construction of the car, getting rid of stuff like magnesium, which was never a good idea in the first place. Those kind of things play much more of a role than just whether or not the car has a long tail. Because it has a bearing, but it's not the be-all and end-all. So you could very justifiably have a fusion between LMP1 
and Group C, a modern Group C car, if you will. Now, I don't know what I'd call the class, but it would be that Fusion. And where the Can-Am aspect comes into play is that my racing series, if I was like the Bernie Eccleston, for instance, of this series with the majority of creative control, then I would like to have a series where the safety standards are upheld to the same degree as the F1 or the modern Le Mans, if not more so, but the payoff would be that I would allow all of the teams not unlimited free reign, but much more of a leash than current racing regulations allow to actually encourage innovation. Because the simple fact is you stifle innovation by making all the teams as similar to each other as possible. You do not get innovation on a grand scale when you do that. You do get innovation, but it could be so much better. Because the kind of innovation that that engenders is K-car innovation, such as in Japan, and what I mean by that is Japanese cars are very heavily heavily regulated and restricted in many ways, such as power, for instance, in different classes. No car can officially have more than 276 horsepower. I don't know if that's still the case, but it was. That's why the RX-7s, the Skylines, the Supras, they were always rated at that much power, even though many of them had more. So with that in mind, those cars became better and better and better because of those restrictions. Now that's a great thing, and of course you see that in the F1 as well. F1 cars are faster than they've ever been, through corners in particular. However, they're not taking the same kind of leaps, if you know what I mean. And I'm not saying that they're not taking leaps. As I just said with the JDM regulations, those cars did become better and better, but imagine how good they could have become if you then took those regulations away and then allowed them to apply all of that brilliance that they'd learned on a larger scale. Imagine what kind of innovation could happen. So that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to kind of use this period of racing which we've had, where we had basically the 70s were absolutely insane, then the 80s started to rein it in a little bit, but they were still they were still extremely fast, then the 90s got much, much slower and much safer, and then the 2000s have started investigating different things, like more safety tech, fuel tech, rather than just making them faster and faster and faster. Which is understandable. And I'm not necessarily saying that I want my regulations to make the cars faster and faster and faster, just in a straight line. That's not what it's about. Because in my racing series, what I would want to see isn't just some crazy fan car over here and a jet engine car over there just because I happen to like that. I do, and I would be happy if a team did that. But what I'm more concerned with is I would like each individual team who is in there, say for instance Mercedes, Jaguar, Porsche, Audi, BMW, Ferrari, Lamborghini, whoever wanted to enter, those teams would all have enough of a free reign to put their own spin within the regulations. And of course, that is currently the case. But it's so restrictive that although it's technically the case, it's not really, because the cars have to be so similar. And the only real variation comes from aerodynamic advantages, such as what the Nissan Nismo had, or if you run it in the Garage 56, where the rules are a little bit more lenient, but then of course your race win doesn't mean as much. Stuff like that, it just makes it, it makes it to me feel a little bit less important when a car does something cool, because you just don't really notice it anymore. Whereas the 787B, it burst onto the scene, was totally different to everything else, and look at the impression it made. Even if it hadn't won, it would have still been remembered, just because of how cool it is. Look again at the Minolta. It didn't even compete in the Le Mans, but look at the fandom that that car has, because it's just a great car. At least, of course, in the world of a game. So what I would like to see is that Can-Am style of having more of a personal flair from team to team. Because you can do both. You can definitely do both. You can have a safer car and a more intriguing car at the same time. Because the kind of cars that I would like to see competing don't necessarily need to be 250 mile per hour machines. That's not necessary. But what I would like to envision is a starting grid of prototype race cars, which are a fusion between Group C and LMP1, 
with the advantages of both in that kind of way. Maybe some closed top ones, some open top ones, but then have it so that, say for instance, the Audi prototype is a diesel, but then the BMW prototype is hydrogen powered, because that's BMW's thing. They've made a number of concept cars doing that kind of thing. So they can use this form of racing to significantly advance the performance side of that tech, because they already know what they're doing with hydrogen, but that can accelerate the process. Then if Mazda were competing, allow them to use a rotary, allow them to make that sky active technology which they're working on even better, because so many road-going improvements have originated in the racing world, and more specifically, it's usually in the F1, but it can come from the Le Mans as well, and allow Mazda, for instance, to use the rotary, allow them to pursue a diesel rotary if they want to. They've done that in the past in concept form, but allow them to pursue it on a bigger scale to work out the kinks in that more exaggerated way. Because when you take a car that has 100 horsepower, and then take that same principle and apply it to a car with 700 horsepower, all of the advantages and disadvantages of that concept are exaggerated, which allows you to identify the good and bad points much more easily. And that's one of the advantages of a race car over just a normal, say, hatchback concept. So allow Mazda to do that. Then you've got Mercedes in there. Who knows what Mercedes might want to do? They might want to run with a diesel. Maybe they want to do some kind of hybrid between diesel and electric, or maybe a petrol and electric. Then you've got Jaguar in there. Jaguar, for instance, they've already shown a propensity for wanting, or at least considering, using turbine technology. They did with the CX-75 concept, with that regenerative gas turbine. I love the Jaguar CX-75. I wish they'd made that car even with the two-litre engine that it was supposed to end up with, I would have loved that far more than the LaFerrari, the P1, or the 918. It's such a great rival for those cars, a gorgeous machine, and it would have been a great successor as well to the XJ220, but that's beside the point. The point of that was that Jaguar has shown a clear, not necessarily desire to put that into production or to race it, but they were at least curious about it. So allow Jaguar to pursue that more. Imagine a Jaguar LMPC car, if you want to think of it that way, with a hybrid system between like a big V12, like what the XJR9 had, coupled with a regenerative turbine, or something like that, so that they can pursue that. Then maybe you have Aston Martin in there with a, a screaming or a howling V12, like the Lola, the B0960. And then you've got all these other teams pursuing different things. Maybe Ferrari, for instance, they want to apply some of the brilliance that they learned from the FF and the GTC4 and basically allow Ferrari to make a four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive prototype. Because in my world, that would be allowed. Because if you think about it, why is all-wheel drive not allowed in motorsport? Or at least... Uh, circuit motorsport, because of course in rallying it is, and technically the hybrid systems do make the cars part-time all-wheel drive, usually out of low-speed corners. But why is it outlawed? Now there may be a specific reason that I'm not aware of, but as far as I'm aware, there's no real significant reason why the cars aren't allowed to be all-wheel drive. It's considered to make them, what, too good? Too fast? Maybe if one team decides to do it and another doesn't? And that brings me again to the inherent problem which I have with a lot of racing. Teams are too petty. They complain about other teams as soon as the teams start getting better. Just look back in the day, people complained about the Chaparral, flicking stones up with the fan car. They complained about the Brabham for the same reason. And it just so happened that those cars were the best thing on the grid. Not the most dominant all the time, the Chaparral, for instance, wasn't very reliable and never even won a race, but it had a ton of potential. The Brabham won its only race and was immediately banned. Now, I'm not saying that flicking stones up is an illegitimate complaint. Of course it is. But to just ban the car because of it, that's an undeniably pandering decision. Because if that were any other piece of technology, they would have said... Come on, guys, let's find a way to work around this. They wouldn't have said, nope, anyone that does it is banned. Or I guarantee if McLaren had developed that fan and Chaparral complained about them, what do you think would have been done? I don't think as much would have been done. 
Maybe it would have been banned, but I doubt it. Why? Because McLaren has more of a voice. Just like if Volkswagen complained about some other team. They're just a bigger company. And they have more clout. That's just the way it works. Now, I'm not saying they need to give people backhanders and all that kind of stuff, but when Audi shouts, people listen. When Spiker shouts, nobody cares, because the size of the manufacturer makes a huge difference in the road, in the racing world, any sphere. And so, with all of that in mind, I want a situation where the teams cannot complain about each other. Because the rules are lenient enough to allow the teams to be as creative as they choose to be. So then, you can say to any of the teams, if you have a complaint about any of the other teams, just do better. Because this whole concept of justifying when the FIA bans someone just because they're too good, the whole Mosler situation, for instance, that is pathetic to me. And I'm not just saying that because I like Mosler. If it was the other way around, if it was one of the bigger teams, the bigger names, against the little guy, instead of being the other way around, I would still have the same issue, because it's not about who you support, it's about the injustice of that decision. It's not right. To say that a team should be banned because the other teams can't be bothered to make their cars better, or to put more money into development which is frankly a pathetic argument in the first place, because teams like Mosler don't have that kind of money, and they're still better because they just have a better idea, or accomplish their idea in a better way. To say that the car has to be banned is so ridiculous. Just allow the car to dominate for that season. They have, after all, earned that. They developed a better car. They should be allowed to win in said better car. But then the next season, don't ban them. The next season, the other teams can become better. That's the whole point of racing. Racing isn't about resting on laurels. If you want to race to rest on your laurels, you are not a race driver. And although this sounds kind of like a rant at this point, <laughs> well, maybe that's just part of the conversation that needs to be said. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to race then suck it up or pull out of the race. Because if you don't like being beaten, make a better car. It's as simple as that. Racing is not about making people feel good, pandering to teams' egos. If you want to win, put in the effort, put in the development. Try maybe having a good idea. How does that sound for a game plan? Instead of having a hissy fit and complaining to the FIA, oh, they're kicking stones up, the car's too fast, we want them removed. No. Grow up. It literally is a case of growing up. Just do better. And quit complaining about the little guy just because he showed you up. Because that's an issue for these bigger teams. They can rest on their laurels. Look at Porsche, for instance. They're not guilty of it, and you've got to love them for doing it. As far as I'm aware, Porsche is not one of those teams that complain about other people, even if they do lose to them. They just, okay, we lost. That's the point of racing. Somebody wins, somebody loses. They just decide to come back better, harder, stronger next year. That's the way it should be done. It's not like these teams, and I'm not going to name names, but you can, I'm sure, think of some that do those kind of petty things like complaining about other teams or trying to get them banned or trying to get them a disadvantage of some kind, basically. It's, it's, it's also pathetic to me. And maybe it's because I'm not in that world because the problem, and I can speak from experience with this, in the world of college, for instance, when I was becoming a fully qualified car mechanic and engineer, when you're in that environment, or in any environment where you're spending exclusive time, or even a majority of time, with a certain group of like-minded people, you become influenced by them. And in the world of racing, they are all like-minded people. And the problem is that just like in other walks of life, when you have a group of people who all basically have the same ideology, you end up complaining about the same petty things within whatever sphere it happens to be. For instance, when people complain about not getting the pay rise that they wanted at a certain job, instead of thinking, I'm not earning less, I'm earning the same or more. No, they're not grateful for that. They just complain about what they don't have that they want, compared to people in other countries who would be happy, happy to have anything. 
So, although that's a tangent, the same issue applies. These bigger teams lose sight of reality. They become dissociated with what is actually involved in being a good team, and they expect to be respected and to be listened to just because they're big and because they've won in the past. And again, I love Porsche for not doing that. Porsche, as far as I know, don't care for that. They just win. And if they don't win, they do better next time. I love that. So with all of this in mind, that would be the primary purpose of my series. To have a series where, if you want to join, if you're a team or a manufacturer, and you want to race in this series, then know what you're getting in for. You better develop something good or just go home. Don't complain, because we're not going to change anything for you. Because at the end of the day, racing has fundamentally changed over the years in terms of how it works. And I don't mean safety or performance or lap times or any of that. I mean, if you compare racing from its early days, for instance, in the Le Mans or the Milli Millia or whatever, and compare it to how it's done now under those similar equivalents, the modern day equivalents, then the way it's done has fundamentally changed. Because back then, with that toodle-pip, tally-ho mentality, the race did not submit to you. You submit to the race. You enter the race, you do what's necessary to win. You don't complain about the other guy, you might bounce against each other in the race and get angry. That's expected. That was part of the fun, and they still do that to this day, even in the F1. Whereas now, it's the almost the opposite way around. People and certain teams, especially the bigger ones, act in this way that they expect preferential treatment just because they're a big company that sells a few cars. Big deal. As far as I'm thinking of it, the FIA should have the attitude of, no, we don't care how big you are. You're in our world now. You submit to our rules if you want to play the game. You don't expect the game to change because you don't like losing. That is no different to somebody who has a hissy fit in a Gran Turismo online race and decides to smash into someone because they're losing. That is literally no different. It's a childish tantrum. But the difference is, when a child has a tantrum, it's considered to be laughable. When Audi has a tantrum, or BMW, or Bentley, or whoever the case may be has a tantrum, oh, well then, people better listen, because of the money behind the team. But the fundamental thing hasn't changed. It's the exact same mindset. So... It's a huge tangent that we've gone on, but it's all incidental and important to why I would want this series to be the case. Why I would want to accomplish something like that. So that you can have this playing field which isn't designed to be level. I don't want to stroke egos. I don't want teams to feel good about themselves. I want them to race and to innovate and to develop. That is what racing is about. Not making people feel good and giving them a kiss on the boo-boo when they lose. No, man up, race again, and win. Otherwise, pull out, go home. So, (laughs) uh, quite a heated discussion there, I guess. Uh, Didn't necessarily intend it to go that way, but that's what needed to be said. And a pretty substantial chunk of the conversation, I didn't expect it to actually last that long, but there you go. So, of course, as with all of these subjects, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts down below. I know a lot of you guys, especially those who are really into motorsports and know more about the regulations than I do, because I'm not into that anymore. I don't specialize in any particular field of car knowledge anymore. I used to when I was a kid. I don't really bother with that anymore. I'm more of like a GP, a general practitioner kind of doctor you know they they don't know everything about any one subject but they know little bits about quite a few that's always the kind of information that i aim to have like here on youtube for instance i don't know everything about any particular car but i know enough about most to have a decent conversation about it that's always what i've tried to do now if somebody wants to specialize good on you That's your thing. Like these guys who love a certain car or a certain manufacturer and they know everything about it. You've got to respect that. You've got to respect that love. Those people are a wealth of knowledge. So as I said, I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. Especially from the point of view of someone who is extremely into the regulation side of things. Like how tall the cars have to be, where the headlights have to be positioned, the wings, all that kind of stuff. So that's basically it for the first topic. Pretty sizable one. That one topic alone, as I alluded to just now, is basically the size of what a normal episode of this series would be. So the next subject 
is a, a bit of a different one, but also kind of a, an abstract concept as well. And that is what kind of concept cars, which either did or didn't reach production, would I like to have been done differently? For instance, maybe a great concept car that didn't reach production, or maybe even something which did reach production, but maybe lost its spark. Maybe it got a bit too watered down. And that sometimes does happen. I'm sure you can think of concept cars which, once they reach the road, just didn't seem as cool anymore. And it's not just about the design, and you guys know this. Sometimes a car just has a cool idea, and then when it reaches the road, the idea's kind of been wrung out by the automotive system for a number of reasons. Development costs, um, sales, projected sales, all that kind of stuff. Maybe it's not deemed necessary, too much of a gimmick. I mean, even the most recent episode of Unsung Heroes, perfect example, the Sosema Gregoire. That car, just not viable for production. Gorgeous as a concept car, very technologically advanced for its time, but fairly obviously from day one, probably not going to make production, and it never did. So, as far as concepts go, that would have been one, funnily enough, that I would have liked to have seen produced, but not necessarily even just the Gregoire, but also others as well. Stuff like the Chrysler turbine car, the Rover turbine cars, they actually made quite a few of those different ones. A number of companies have tried to make turbine-powered cars a reality, but as I touched on in that video, the Unsung Heroes episode, very few of them afford the gas turbine the time and the effort which it requires. Because the gas turbine engine, when it comes to a, a mass production scale, or to be honest, any kind of production scale, because even the Y2K motorbike, they only built 17 of them. So it's still super rare, and I believe you can buy them made to order now, so I'm not sure how many are actually in existence. But making that work on any kind of production basis, even just as a concept car, is a daunting thing. So it's not the kind of thing which a company can just dabble in for the sake of it. It's not like, oh, what shall we do today? Let's make a gas turbine powered hatchback. <laughs> you don't just do that. It's the kind of thing where if you're gonna do it, you've got to commit 100% because it demands that respect and that kind of development. And I think it's a real shame that turbines haven't been pursued more because it, maybe it's one of those things which doesn't have a place on the road. Maybe it would only have a place in the racing world. Now, I, I don't recall if gas turbines have actually been banned, or if they were just not allowed due to general regulations. Because, like, for instance, again, in the Le Mans, you have to have a certain engine size, and very few are allowed to stray from that. So maybe that's more the case. Maybe it wasn't so much banned as more just phased out, or that the regulations were manoeuvred in such a way that it just wasn't possible. That could have happened. Either way, it's just not done anymore. They tried it a couple of times in the Indy, the Lotus Type 56, and also I think the 56B might have also had a, a gas turbine, the more F1 Grand Prix style versions. I can't remember if it was the 56B or the 57. One of the two. I think it was the 56B though. And of course the STP Special, the one which almost won a race, which had the tandem engine. The turbine was next to the driver instead of behind you, which is a pretty cool concept as well. Very Hot Wheels car in its design. But the turbine could have been one of those things which needed to stay in the racing world. Because I don't know if you guys have thought about this, I'm sure some of you have. But it is something which I've thought about before. There are certain pieces of technology or certain innovations which, by their definition need to stay within a certain sphere of use. For instance, the pre-select gearbox that I talked about in the Unsung Heroes episode, where it's not quite an automatic, but it's kind of a semi-automatic to some degree, where back in the 30s and 40s, certain cars would have this pre-selected gearbox where you've got you know the big stick shift next to the steering wheel, and when you know that you need to change up or down a gear, you would put it into the gear that you want, and then a few seconds later the car would change for you. So kind of like a semi-automatic. But that was of its time. You don't need that anymore. So that's, what, that's kind of what I mean. Something which is of its time or of its situation, and it works well in that situation, but it's just not necessary beyond that. And another way that I can highlight that issue or that principle is if you think of the fan car, the Chaparral or the Brabham or the Red Bull, all of those, excuse me, those vehicles which either in the real world with the Chaparral and the Brabham or in the fictional world with 
the Red Bull, but still using real-world principles, that I do believe, as much as I love it, the fan system might be my single favourite racing advancement ever. But even for a super fan like me of that technology, and I do adore that technology because it's such a simple concept, but even I have to admit, that needs to stay in the racing world. Ironically, for the exact same reason that I mentioned earlier, the other teams were complaining about. But the difference is, complaining about stones getting thrown up on a racetrack is a bit different to complaining about that on the road. In fact, it's entirely different, because a racetrack is designed to be as smooth, as clean, and as clear as possible. There aren't supposed to be stones on the road. They want to get as much of that as possible off of the road to have a smooth race. On the road, <laughs> forget it. Nobody is driving down the street getting rid of stones for you. You just drive over whatever happens to be there. So on the road, although sometimes some companies have tried to make it work, Aerial, for instance, actually made an Aerial Atom concept which had a, a ground effect fan. I'm not sure how far they got with that concept, but for the road, it's inherently flawed. Because on the road, it's a much less pure situation to put it in. So you're essentially taking something that works great in its pure world of motorsport, but then when you put it in the muddy, gravel-covered streets of the real world, it just doesn't work. Because instead of sucking up that nice, pure track day air and sucking the car to the ground and giving you great downforce, well, now you're on the street and you're sucking up twigs, paper, <laughs> you know, crisp wrappers, and shoving that all through the fan system. That's not ideal. You're going to be bunging up the system, maybe even jamming the fan, shooting stuff out the back of the car, most likely into the windscreens of other cars. And in the racing world, paint chips don't really matter. The cars get wear and tear. That's a part of the deal. On the road, if you scratch someone's paint with stones flicking out the back of your sports car because it's got a fan system, they ain't going to be happy. They don't care how fast your car is, you just scratch their paint. <laughs> Whereas in the racing world, who cares? The cars get scratched all the time. Of course they want them to look good, but that's inevitable. So there are just inherently some things that do work well in one sphere of life, but you just change one tiny aspect of that sphere and it immediately doesn't work anymore. For instance, the fan, take it on a racetrack, works beautifully. Make one slight change, change it from a racetrack to a road, immediately you've got problems. So that's one of the issues that I have when it comes to concept cars, because as much as I would love to have something like a fan car or a gas turbine on a production scale, including the ones that have been concepts like the Aerial Atom, the Chrysler Turbine car, a variety of others, the Gregoire, there are just some ideas which inherently don't really work as much as you might want them to, and as much as I want them to. And again, touching on something which I talked about in that video, it really does make me appreciate a company like MTT all the more, because they actually made it work. And unless you're a fan of the Y2K motorbike, which most people aren't, I know that. I know that I am in the minority of people to love that bike, especially to have it as their favourite vehicle. But it makes me really appreciate just how good a job they did. Because to be able to ride a motorbike down the street with a helicopter engine that puts out exhaust fumes that are hot enough to cook a chicken, literally, that's not even a joke, you actually can, 650 degrees Celsius. And to make that work, to make it a vehicle which, instead of turning the key and literally blowing you up instantly, you can just turn it on and trundle down to the shops for a bottle of milk on a gas turbine powered motorbike and it works like a charm. In fact, as I alluded to in that video, you get a lifetime warranty on the engine. Lifetime of the owner. Who else does that? Rolls Royce doesn't even do that. But they do it because the engines are so good. And ironically, <laughs> I said that Rolls Royce doesn't do that. That is a Rolls Royce engine. And yet Rolls Royce aren't offering the warranty on it. MTT are. Because for those who don't know, Rolls-Royce motor cars and Rolls-Royce aerospace are two very different things. Now, with the Y2K, it's something which shouldn't work. That motorbike shouldn't exist. And when it comes to cars, 
it's a little bit more difficult to make that work. Because with a motorbike, you've got certain advantages in terms of stuff like cooling, for instance. You've got so much more opportunity to have exposed bodywork or to use the natural airflow of a motorbike to cool the engine far more than a car can. Because with a car, you've got this powerful engine basically locked inside a box under the bonnet. In a motorbike, you can have it, in effect, much more exposed to the wind and have kind of an air cooling element there, more so than in a car. But, of course, you still have issues with the bike, but they iron them out. But beyond just gas turbines and fan cars and stuff like that, if you're talking specific concepts which I wanted to see happen, well, there are always some that come to mind. And, funnily enough, I actually own a number of them as model cars now. The number one for me is always the same, and it's my favourite concept car of all time, the Cadillac 16, which I talked about recently in a Project Gotham 4 video, because I just love that car. It doesn't offer anything particularly radically different. It is a radical car, but it doesn't offer anything radically different. It's one of those cars which... It's in effect the limo equivalent of a Veyron. In a very literal sense, it's one of those cars which enters a very crowded market, the limo market, or in the case of the Veyron, the supercar market, but then what it does is very clever, because instead of trying to be just the fastest or just the most expensive, it tries to be one of those cars which is the one that you would want to have in a pack of top trumps. It's that card that every kid wants to have, because all of the numbers will beat your opponent for everything. One of those stupidly OP cars in every way. Like the Veyron. 8 litres, 16 cylinders, 4 turbos, 1,000 horsepower. Now, of course, it's been surpassed in a number of ways. And yet, very few cars can outsurpass the Veyron in every way. Even something like a Hennessy Venom, or an Ultima Aero, or a Koenigsegg, they can beat the Veyron in a number of ways, and yet... If you're talking sheer points, for instance, like the way that we do it in Rivals matches, the Veyron is such a difficult car to beat because it's so strong across the board. The TVR Speed 12 is very similar in that regard, but the difference with the Speed 12 is the TVR Speed 12 is kind of like what the Veyron would be if you gave no thought to safety whatsoever. <laughs> because the Speed 12 has those huge numbers. It's got 7.7 .7 litre, 12 cylinders... 880 horsepower, it only weighs like a thousand kilos, massive, massive horsepower per ton beyond 800. It's, again, big numbers kind of car, and that's what brings me back to the Cadillac 16 again, because it's the exact same kind of thing. It's a huge limo, bigger than a Rolls-Royce, 13.6 litre, 16 cylinders, a thousand horsepower, and although, if you're talking class... Well, the Cadillac 16, ironically enough, I would call a new money kind of car. It's not old money. Old money is Rolls-Royce. And for those who are unfamiliar with the term, maybe some younger viewers, old money versus new money is like old school class versus new school style. Like baggy trousers versus a tuxedo kind of thing. Old school money is like Rolls-Royce, Bentley, some others, but those are the primary two. And then you've got others which are new school money, you know, turning up in a Beamer or a Maybach. Now, the ironic thing about Maybach is they actually fall on the side of the camp which you wouldn't expect them to be, because Maybach is a very old company, and yet they're kind of garish. They don't have class. They're expensive and they're luxurious, but they're not considered to be as classy as a Rolls-Royce or a Bentley, even though they are as old. So that's kind of weird, because Maybach is more new money than old money. The Cadillac... And the reason why I would say it's ironic is because it's inspired by old money, like the Cadillac 16 from the 1930s, which incidentally is a colossal car, physically speaking. It's a huge vehicle. If you see it parked next to the 16 concept from today, it's even bigger, especially in terms of height. But the ironic thing is, just like Maybach, the Cadillac 16 takes a very new money approach to an old money inspiration. It's like the gangster cars from the 30s, but it's got the big chrome wheels and the low-cut window line of the 2000s. But the difference for me personally with the Cadillac is that unlike Maybach, it pulls it off. Because there's a certain point where you can become so garish that it becomes classy again. 
And to me, that's the boundary that the Cadillac goes over. Because, technically speaking, the Cadillac should be an offensive car. Because it's so stupid. And yet it's not. It's an awesome car. Whereas Maybach, they push it far enough to be stupid and not really very classy, but they don't push it far enough. Which is why I think the Accelero, the Maybach Accelero, is such a great concept car, because that car got it. It understood what it wanted to be. It pushed it so far that it became cool again, like the Maybach equivalent of an SLR McLaren. And that car, ironically, was just designed to show what a certain set of tyres could do. That's pretty awesome. As far as other concepts which I'd like to have seen made, of course the Chrysler ME412 is a constant one, unfortunate situation with the SLR kind of drowning that car out of existence but um, as far as others there are plenty which I like I love the GT90 I love kind of the Speed 12 the TVR is still kind of a concept car although there were a couple road registered one I believe has been rebuilt recently in bare carbon fibre but still kind of like a rolling prototype I guess you could call it what other ones are there? the Peugeot 907 the far lesser known Peugeot Oxia, which is an awesome kind of Peugeot's answer to the Lamborghini Diablo kind of thing. But um, yeah, there are plenty. The Volkswagen Nardo would have been a nice car. And also, on a slight side note about the Volkswagen Nardo, I don't understand Volkswagen's reasoning with that car. Because as far as I can remember, they didn't produce it because they decided it wouldn't be in line with the concept of a people's car. Because that's what Volkswagen means, people's car. So, how can you not produce the Nardo, but then produce a 6-litre W12 Phaeton? What part of that is a people's car? It's like a 90 grand sedan. How is that a people's car? It's just a rebadged Bentley Flying Spur. That's not a people's car, that's a one percenters car. So, what about that car is more people-ish than the Nardo? If you're going to make something that opulent... Why not just go all in and make a supercar? But for whatever reasons they didn't, I think that's a real shame, because the Nardo is one of my favourite supercar concept designs. In particular, though, my favourites are actually the pre-Nardo versions, because the Nardo came out in 2001, and it has the Nardo average speed record, which is cool, but I prefer the ones which are older. They came out in 97, and they were the W12 Synchro, which is the coupe version in bright yellow, and the W12 Roadster, which is in red. And both of those had more like, I think it was 420 horsepower. Much, much slower, but they look, I think, even better. The back end is very similar on the coupe. Front end is slightly different, though. It comes in yellow with a blue interior, which immediately grabs my attention because I adore cars with blue, red, or white interiors. You don't see many with that, though. And the Roadster... Well, the Roadster is gorgeous put simply. And one of the reasons why I love the Roadster is because of the windshield design. It's a speedster, technically, not a roadster, because it, like the Eagle E-Type, it doesn't have a traditional window arrangement like a normal convertible would. It has that very low-cut window line, which almost has an invisible top to it. You know, there's not any metal bar at the top, it's just an invisible glass window in front of you. I love that kind of design. So as far as concepts go in a general sense, it's always the supercars that I would have liked to have seen happen. And even with Cadillac, the Cadillac Sian would have also been a lovely car to see produced because that would have literally been America's answer to the Zonda. I mean, if you compare the specs, the similarities are undeniable. Over 7 litres from a V12, that kind of more oddball left field choice, but with a really unique, angular, sharp style thinking of Zonda here, I know I certainly am, but they didn't produce it, which is a shame. I, I definitely think it's more of a shame that the 16 didn't get produced though, because the CN, yeah, I can understand why they didn't produce that, but with the 16, that, that plays right into Cadillac's entire fan base. That's the kind of people who buy them, those older people, those retirees who have earned enough cash to buy one of these super luxurious cars, Maybe they're American people, they want to support the American brand, old money, again, that kind of thinking, which I have no problem with that, I love Cadillacs, and they would love to buy that top-tier Cadillac, but there just isn't one. They're not on the market because the 16 wasn't produced. And although Cadillac is a luxury brand, they haven't really had that car in their lineup, or a car that represents that segment of the lineup, for about 30 or 40 years now. I mean, when's the last time they did that? 
truly. I don't just mean a big car, I mean top tier luxury. The last time they did that was probably what? The late 60s with the Coupe de Ville? Maybe, like 66 or 69, maybe the early 70s, but not really. They started getting like front wheel drive and stupid stuff like that. So the late 60s, I guess, is probably one of the last, maybe, the DeVille, as I said. And uh, of course, the further back you go, the better it gets. My personal favourite, the 59 Buritz, the absolute pinnacle of American luxury in the 50s. Then you go back even further, the Cadillac 16 from the, what was it, 30s, I think? Absolute top-tier luxury. There were others out there, your Duesenbergs, stuff like that, but Cadillac was the American Rolls-Royce, and they were proud of it. So they should be. Nowadays, well, nowadays Cadillac is more like the Mercedes of America than the Rolls-Royce of America, and that's a shame, because they definitely have the potential to be more. It's working for them, and you've got to love them for that. You know, the V models, which are really fast, I love them. As I said, I'm a huge Cadillac fan, but I do think it's a shame that that one didn't really get its chance, because the Cadillac 16, it could have been one of those cars in a similar way to the Rolls-Royce Phantom that almost has like an endless production run. It's the kind of car that doesn't need a facelift. You just start producing it and never really stop. And you can't say that that ideology doesn't work because look at Bentley and Morgan. Morgan have been producing the same car design for like 150 years. The car hasn't changed that much. And their waiting list is like two decades long because it works. People know what they want, and they know what they're getting with Mosler. Uh, Morgan, even. <laughs> Mosler. <laughs> but uh, with Bentley, for instance, in more recent times, the Bentley Continental GT debuted in the early 2000s, and it hasn't really changed. You look at the Bentley Continental GT now, compare it to first generation, it hasn't changed that much. It's got more power, and it's faster, blah blah blah, but the car is still the same car. It's got the same shape, same purpose, same underlying design. But I think that's it for concepts. So what about the next subject? Well, the next subject is getting more into the side of things that I was mentioning at the start of the video about FAQs, those frequently asked questions, kind of, but more so subjects or issues that people have on the channel. For instance, why do I do my videos in this certain way? Or why do I do that in this way? And I wanted to just clear that up for maybe some people who are newer on the channel, or maybe even people who have been around for longer or who just haven't thought to ask, or haven't asked, or maybe haven't heard when I've answered. So some of the things that I wanted to discuss were stuff like, one of the most common questions I get asked is, do I use a wheel? It comes up a lot on the channel. Do you use a wheel? What kind of racing wheel do you use? Do you use controller or a wheel? Why don't you use a wheel? It's actually very simple. I prefer a controller. It really is as simple as that. Because I know that there's this whole culture within gaming. And it's not just racing games, but in specific terms, it is racing games for this conversation. But you know those guys, maybe you're one of them, but for most people, we're not. But doubtless you know people, or have come into contact with them, who are self-proclaimed elitists. They believe themselves to be better than other players because they use a wheel, because they turn traction control off, because they do this or that, because they're driving cockpit can. They feel that it makes them a superior driver, a better player, a more professional driver. Newsflash, it doesn't, because it's a game. If it was in the real world, then we might actually care but it's still just a game at the end of the day, and no amount of FIA involvement is going to change that. It's a game, by definition. So with that in mind, this whole concept of being a superior player just because you use a wheel is such folly to me. I have no time for those people. They don't impress me in the slightest. I think they're pathetic, quite frankly, and I joke, and it's ironic how highly they think of themselves. It's almost like they're the only one in the room who doesn't get that they are the joke. But, you know, choose each to their own. And I'm by no means saying that using a wheel makes you an elitist. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that if you use a wheel, I despise you. Not at all. If people want to use a wheel, you go ahead. That's what it's supposed to be for. It's more so the people who think that that's the only way that's acceptable. 
otherwise you're some kind of low-life degenerate who doesn't know how to play a game. Get real. Grow up. And I think that is often the case. Those people do need to grow up because they are generally younger players who don't know anything about anything. So the reason why I don't use a wheel is, as I said, I quite simply prefer a controller. For those who are maybe wondering, I have used a wheel in the past, on a few occasions, and I wasn't even bad with it. I picked it up pretty fast, and I did pretty well in racing. You can even find on YouTube, not on this channel, but on another guy's channel from the GT Sport release event in London in 2016, I raced with a wheel for the first time on Gran Turismo Sport. And I didn't have much of a chance to get a hold of the wheel. Going from a controller to the wheel was difficult, especially given how much different Gran Turismo Sport's physics are to GT6 and even to any other previous GT game. And yet I signed myself up to do one of the live races, 16 people in the race, all sitting in their own racing wheel. I sat in for the race as, or I put my name down, I should say, as a stand-in because I wasn't quite confident enough to try and get in the main event, so I just said, put me down as one of the stand-ins. Somebody didn't show up, and they called my name. So I thought, well, here we go, time to embarrass myself. So I got up on stage, sat in one of the seats. Some of the uh, guys at Polyphony were helping people to set up the chairs, because for those who don't know, I'm not exactly the smallest of people, so sitting in a racing chair that's just been used by like a 13-year-old, it doesn't really work for me, so uh, the chairs had to be adjusted, all that kind of stuff. Get a, get the pedals the right distance away, and the, the steering wheel, all that kind of good stuff. And then, you know, I know what I'm doing when it comes to the menus. Any of us do. You don't need to have played the new Gran Turismo game to know what your preferences are. The first thing you do is you go into the menu, you turn off your traction control, you turn down your ABS, you change your steering style, change your camera of choice... You know, all this kind of stuff that you like. You know your preferences. So I did all that stuff, and then the guy who came over to help me out, who didn't speak the best of English, which, you know, it's fair enough, but it doesn't exactly help when you're trying to have a conversation with someone, he uh, changed a number of the settings which I had changed to different ones. Specifically stuff to do with, like, force feedback and all that kind of stuff, which I don't use that, really. Uh, I don't know what kind of a bearing that has on a controller, because I've never felt the need to mess around with that setting. I think it's more of an issue for the wheel use. Either way, he changed that up. Sure, I didn't really care. Went with it. Started the race. I can't remember where I started on the grid, but doubtless you can see it in that YouTube video. But, um... I ended up finishing 4th out of 16 people, which I was pretty pleased about, given that that was the first day I'd ever driven GT Sport, period, but it was also with a wheel, which I don't use generally, so I was pretty happy with that. So, overall, I don't dislike people who use wheels. I don't even dislike wheels themselves. To me, using a wheel is actually in the exact same camp as using a manual gearbox, because, as many of you guys know, I always drive automatic unless I absolutely have to use a manual. For instance, on Forza, for drag racing, you have to use a manual if you want to win. That's <coughs> that's just the way it is. And more often manual with clutch, which makes you even quicker. Me not using manual isn't because I can't. And that's the attitude that these elitists have. They interpret using a controller, for instance, or using an automatic gearbox, or having traction control maybe turned on one, or ABS on one, they see that as you not being able to do it any other way, therefore and thereby making you a novice. That's not the case. It's just a matter of choice. For instance, me, I don't use traction control, but as I say in my videos, if you want to use traction control, go right ahead. That's the whole point of having personal preferences. If the makers of the game intended people to all be these elitist level gamers, then turning off traction control wouldn't even need to be an option. You just wouldn't have it in the first place. So the fact that they even give that option shows that they value choice. So who are you to say otherwise if you are one of these elitists? It's as simple as that. So with a manual, I choose to use an auto for the simple fact that I'm lazy. And I will own that, because there's a difference between being a noob and being lazy. I could put down lap times with an automatic gearbox, which would put most manual users to shame on games like Forza. On Forza Horizon, for instance, on the biggest track in the game called Goliath, I was in the top five in the world with an auto gearbox. All of the others were manual with clutch. 
And at that time, I was also using traction control, and I was still faster than everyone else, because traction control slows you down through corners, it limits throttle use, and I was still faster. So it's not exactly like I need traction control, I just couldn't be bothered to do anything else. Because this is another issue which arises from the whole elitist noob dichotomy between the two, and that is that they seem to think that there's no variation. It's either one or the other. You are great, or you're nothing. There's loads of variation in between. Of course there is. And many of us fall between the two. We're not the best of drivers. I'm the first to say it. I'm not the fastest of drivers. I tend to be six or seven seconds slower than whatever the world's best is on any given track. Sometimes it varies, but generally speaking, that's what it is for me. At the same time, though, we're very rarely the absolute slowest. We are, most of us, somewhere between the two. That's a pretty good place to be, because at the end of the day, I don't play games to prove how good I am at playing games. I play games to have fun. And so many people seem to have forgotten that as a concept, that they just play games to try and prove something to someone. Proving something to someone who doesn't care. It's so weird. But hey, that's, that's their choice, I guess. It's just a very unfortunate one, because once again, they're the only ones in the room who don't get that everyone's laughing at them, not with them. But hey. So, another aspect that I wanted to talk about on the channel was actually in a similar vein to what I just said. It, it actually leads, in effect, directly on from it, and that is a number of people in the past have asked me, why do I talk or explain things in the way that I do on the channel? And this is much more so in terms of tuning. And this is more a general tip for those of you who want to be YouTubers, who, or who want to produce YouTube videos of your own, maybe in the racing world, maybe not. But this question of, why do I talk about tuning in such a way that makes it sound almost childish sometimes. I dumb things down. That's the way they put it. That's the way they see it. Whereas to them, they don't understand why I would say things that way. Why don't I actually call things the correct technical term or go into it even more in depth than I do? Surely, if you have that kind of information, you should do that. Well, it's the same situation. Going into a game is about fun for me. It's not about proving something. And this is the inherent piece of advice that I would give anyone on YouTube who is trying to do some form of resource video. Because for those who maybe haven't realised, this channel is not about entertainment. If you are entertained by my content, that's great. I'm glad you are. But this channel is first and foremost a resource. That's what it's supposed to be, like a library within the world of YouTube, specifically for racing games. I'm that guy who you can go to who's probably done a video about whatever it is you're looking for within a racing game. Of course, with gaps. Obviously, I'm not going to cover absolutely everything, but you know what I mean. Especially when it comes to Gran Turismo, and to some degree Forza as well. Now, with that in mind, if you consider it from the point of view of being a teacher, because at the end of the day, tune setups are tutorials, and as the word tutorial describes, it is a tutoring system or a teaching system. So, if you think about it this way, and, and it really does simply answer why I dumb things down in my videos, although it's not dumbing them down, but that's the way it's often called, if you have a teacher in a classroom, the teacher is not there to prove to the kids how smart he is. And if he is, he's not a very good teacher, and he won't have the job for very long, and he won't teach anyone anything of any use, and the kids probably won't like him. In any scenario, not just with kids, if you have a supervisor over a group of people in a job and he's constantly trying to make himself look better than them, that's not what he is supposed to be doing. He facilitates them to do their job better. He's to give them the tools and the support that they need to be better than him. The purpose of a teacher is to make the student surpass them in any form of teaching. And that is what I've always tried to do on YouTube. I am not on YouTube 
to prove how smart I am when it comes to tuning cars, because if I wanted to prove that, I wouldn't make any videos. I would keep all of that information for myself and beat most people who I come across online. Not everyone, but a lot more. Imagine how many people who have raced against me are using my methods. I don't know how many do, but doubtless at least some are. Would they be as fast on, say, a top speed track without that tune setup? Probably not. Do I lord it over them? No, because that's not the point. And this is the fundamental advice that I would give those who do want to make those kind of tutorial or instructional videos on YouTube, and that is don't try and prove to anyone how smart you are. Let your product speak for itself. Make the product the smart thing, not you, because then people will want to come back. Because if you are constantly saying things that highlight how cool you are and how clever you are and aren't I such a cool dude, nobody wants to hear that. Now, of course, these days on YouTube, apparently people, for some strange reason, do like hearing that. Stuff like the Paul brothers, Jake and Logan. Uh, they're idiots, and yet people seem to like that. Young kids especially. I don't get that, but maybe I'm getting old. <laughs> but whatever the case may be, that kind of mentality is much more popular now than it was 10 years ago. Because stupidity sells these days. Whereas those of us who are actually trying to get a, a smarter audience, and although this channel is not very big, I value all of you guys who watch these videos. As I've said before, I value the haters and the dislikers because they give me free views anyway, but even those who aren't haters, those who are supporting the channel, commenting, liking, even just viewing the video when you get a chance, I value you because I consider my audience on this channel to be a very high quality community. You're smart people. Not because you watch my stuff, but because I don't have to explain things to you usually more than once. Because I say it, and you get it. And if you don't get it, there's not a problem with that, because I'll probably touch on the subject again, or say it in a different way next time, or maybe just explain it in a better way for you, personally. Because that's always been the case. The, the people who flaunt what they have don't impress me at all. The smartest people don't need to shout about it. And I'm not saying that because I don't shout about it, I'm one of the smartest people, of course not. But you know what I mean. So, yeah, that's it's kind of a side tangent, I guess, but it does directly lead on from the whole controller versus wheel thing, or the automatic versus manual thing. It's all basically under that same umbrella of people who are, <coughs> excuse me, lacking confidence in themselves. And they need people to recognise how cool they are. Put that to one side... And you'll be far more successful, because the quality of the fan base and the audience and the community which you will get will be so much better, because you'll have people who enjoy your work, but they're not mindless lemmings. And that is cool, and that's what you guys are on the channel, and I appreciate that. It's awesome to have that kind of community, to have a community which are intelligent people unfortunately is a rare thing on YouTube. And that's something which I couldn't ask for a better scenario than that. That is the exact kind of audience that I want to have. So as far as YouTube and uh, running a channel goes, that was actually another thing which I wanted to touch on briefly towards the end of this video now. Touching on more than just, you know, why you make videos and stuff like that, because that's all down to you. But there were three principles that I think, even though this channel, you know, this channel isn't huge, but it's doing very well for its size. We bring in over 10,000 views a day across the channel. Subscribers are increasing very well. December and January, January in particular, is supposed to be the worst month of the year for building a YouTube channel, but we're growing at a great rate. It's going really well. So, something's going right. So with that in mind, there are three primary principles that I've always tried to do with this channel, and they have made it what it is now. Of course, my end of the deal, because you have made it what it is now as well. But, of course, that part's out of my hands. That's for you guys to do and to engender and to support, and etc. But the three things in particular are, one, identify something that you love. It's got to be a subject which can last you decades without getting bored of it. 
So for me, that's cars. And on YouTube, even more specifically, racing games. But just cars in general. Unsung Heroes, for instance. It's not a gaming series, it's just cars, because I love talking about them. Then the second principle, because that first principle is the most important. If you go into YouTube just trying to get views or to make money, you will not last. Because you'll end up copying other people, or imitating styles, or just creating stuff that you hate just because you think it will be successful. No, you need to find something that you genuinely love, regardless of the amount of views that it gets. The second thing, which is directly tied into that, is find something that you're good at. And that may sound like the same thing, but it really isn't. Because if you have something that you're good at, but you don't love, don't necessarily make videos about it, because you won't come across as being authentic. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean that you'll enjoy it. You might be good at a sport on your first try, but you still don't want to pursue it as your job. Whereas the other way around, you might absolutely love something, but not really be good enough at it. For me, for instance, I have videos on YouTube of doing certain sound effect tutorials for beatboxing. Those tutorials work. Some of them have tens of thousands of views. But at the same time, I'm not a particularly good beatboxer. I can beatbox and I can do sound effects, but I'm not what is traditionally called a good beatboxer. So I recognised my limit and ended it there. I was good at the specific sounds, the tutorials, the technical side of things, in a very similar way to the tuning for games, but that's where it ended for me. So just like with tuning, I am much more of a tuner than I am a driver, which is why I don't talk about driving methods that much on the channel. I do have people saying to me, could you do tutorials of how I can be faster? And as much as I would like to, that's just not really my forte. I am fast enough for what I need to do. I'm happy with the speed that I can do around a track. But that doesn't automatically make me capable of teaching someone else to be that fast. With tuning, I can, because that's my forte. But with driving, not so much. Whereas some guys, they don't know a thing about tuning, but they could teach you how to go faster around a track because they have that passion. I just don't have that passion for that side of things. My passion comes from talking about cars, such as reviewing them or spotlighting them, and tuning them. That's always been the case. And I have never actually played racing games because I enjoy racing. It's actually my least favourite part of the game. Racing is always a means to an end to me, because the goal of every racing game that I play is to own and tune and drive all of the cars. That's always where I get my fun from. And you can tell that from all the tuning that I do and the, the reviews that I do for them. So the first principle is something that you love. That is essential. The second principle is that thing also needs to be something that you're good at. Because otherwise, why should anyone come to you about it? The inverse of that, though, is that if you are bad enough at something to make it into a parody, that can also work. But you need to be on either end of the spectrum. Anywhere between those two just won't really work. The third thing is to be original. And that's something which so many people, so many YouTubers talk about on YouTube. It has almost become a cliche, but the reason why it's a cliche is because it's so fundamentally important. It's not difficult to copy someone. Anyone can imitate someone's voice. You might not be good at it, but you can do it. Anyone can imitate a video style, jump cuts in a certain way, outro music of a certain style. Anyone can do that. YouTubers imitate each other all the time, sometimes in fun, in jest, sometimes mean-spirited, and sometimes just ripping people off straight up. That's not a good idea. Not because you aren't going to make views from it. Sometimes you will. Sometimes you might make a quick buck. But being a YouTuber is not about making a quick buck. And a common misconception is that to be a good YouTuber, you need to bring in viral video-type views every day. That's not the case. Being a good, successful channel on YouTube and a good, successful business, because that's exactly what it is, this channel is already a business. I have a tax bracket on this channel because it's official. It's not playing, it's not a, a hobby, it's a business. And that should be your goal. If you're trying to do YouTube seriously, think of it as a business, not a hobby. And that's what I've always tried to do. I've tried to run my channel in a way that acts much bigger than my channel actually is. And I've had quite a few comments from you guys saying, oh, this channel is run like a 100k channel. I appreciate those comments because that's what I'm trying to do. The channel size should not restrict the quality of your content. 
Your production equipment might limit you, but you can make good quality content regardless of your production. Look at my older videos on the potato camera. If those videos were trash, nobody would have come back. And yet those potato camera videos have thousands of views, or at least some of them do. Why? Because it's not about a pretty video. It's about content that is valuable, that works. Those videos are four years old and they still work. That is what you need to achieve. And you cannot achieve that by copying someone else's style. And I don't mean just me, I mean anyone. You can be inspired by people, you can pay homage to them. I have a number of inspirations on YouTube. Some of my biggest imp inspirations are Rhett and Link, just in a general sense, they're my favourite YouTubers. <coughs> Excuse me again. I'm not necessarily inspired by them in any specific way, as far as how I do my stuff, but just in a general sense, I appreciate their work ethic, and I also value being, in effect, old-school YouTube. I run my channel in like a 2009 kind of way, and I'm proud of that. I am OG YouTube, because for those who don't know, this channel was actually from 2009, <coughs> although I didn't start doing it properly until 2013. So... I get that inspiration from them, and then there's a really small channel, and ironically, he was a hero of mine. Well, a hero is a strong term, but he was an inspiration for sure, and now I've actually outpaced this channel, which is so weird, but a channel called Little Jimmy 835 And he did a series called What Happened to The, and he does What Happened to the Alien franchise, What Happened to the Terminator franchise, and he talks about movies, he's an Australian guy, he talks about movies which started off really great and just went downhill. And he breaks it down, what happened, what went wrong, how could it be done better? And his kind of style and his simple, direct approach, which is understandable for everyone, again, that was an inspiration. And yet, if you play my video next to his, they're not the same. Because you can be inspired by someone without aping them, without copying them. And that is important on YouTube. Draw inspiration from everything, but don't copy anything. That is the important thing, because if your success is dependent on copying someone else, then if you think about it, that is a fundamentally flawed concept. Because if you're coming into YouTube and you think, wait a second, I could actually do this really easily. Just find someone who's good at it and copy what they do, because then I can get the same views and the same channel size. Simple, easy, just copy whatever they do, let them do the work, and I'll ride their success. That seems like a good idea if you're in it for that. It really isn't, because if you think about it a little bit further, what does that actually mean? Well, if you copy someone's style, that means that by definition, you're trying to appeal to the same audience. The same audience which is already watching them. So if they're already watching them, and you're just copying them, why do they need you? They don't. Not only are you not going to have the originality working in your favour, but you're also going to be an unnecessary carbon copy of the source that people already go to. So it's far better to be original, to be unique to yourself, and to put your own spin on it. For instance, what I do isn't fundamentally new. People do car reviews, people do tuning. But if you look within the specific sphere and the type of videos that I do, there isn't much else that's actually like it. Because it's possible to do it with your own spin, but it's not as easy to do it without copying. So those three things are definitely the most important. Find something that you love, and if that thing that you love is also some, something that you're good at, then pursue it. And then bring in the third point of keeping your own original spin. Because if you put your own original spin on it, now you've given people a reason to come back. And that is always the way that I've tried to run my channel. And as a slight, well, it's actually a major one, but also another piece of advice that I would give, and this is something which I've always tried to do, and I believe I have raised this before, and I'll probably raise it again because there are always new people on the channel who haven't heard these things and probably won't go back to watch older videos. But another thing which I always tried to do is, as I alluded to earlier, Try and run your channel in the way that a bigger channel would. Because if you can make your channel appear as professional as possible, 
people will come back because people appreciate professionalism. If you run your channel showing that you take it seriously, then people will come back. And that really does make a huge difference, not just in the obvious way of bringing back people, but also in terms of job opportunities which you will get, companies who will contact you, such as companies which have contacted me, which would not have happened if it was an unprofessional environment. So overall, that's it for this omnibus episode, if you want to consider it that way. I'm going to have to rewatch this entire thing to put all the time codes in myself down in the description. So, uh, yeah, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. If you've stuck around for the whole thing, then you must have had a lot of time on your hands, so thank you for that. And, of course, those who wanted to see the final episode of Black Sight. I hope you've enjoyed that as well. And if you want to check out the other episodes of Black Sight, you can click through at the end of this video. And if you want to see the race that I had in London on the wheel, then I'll put a link in the description to that as well. But that's it for this pick. I'll see you guys next time. And as always, thanks for watching.